Over the last several weeks, we have been working our way through the seven churches in Revelation. And the first church that we looked at was Ephesus and how they had lost their first love. They weren't loving God and they weren't loving others fully. And then we came to Smyrna, who was a church that was facing tremendous persecution. They were struggling with finances. They were struggling with imprisonment. They were struggling and fighting for their very lives because of their faith. And yet, they strive to remain faithful in the midst of that struggle and in the midst of that persecution. And then we come to Pergamum where we learn that it's important that we don't compromise our our faith, where we don't compromise our values, where we don't compromise who we are as followers of Jesus Christ. And then last week, we looked at Thyatira and the importance of not following after false prophets or false teachers by making sure that we're testing those who are preaching and teaching, by making sure that we're testing the spirits, by making sure that we know what is true and modeling our lives after that. And today we're going to look at the church of Sardis. A church that had the appearance of life, but was struggling because they were for the most part dead. So I'd like to invite you to turn with me this morning in your Bibles, or if you have your Bible apps handy, to read with me Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Sardis. This is the message from the one who has the sevenfold spirit of God and the seven stars. I know all the things you do and that you have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what little remains, for even what is left is almost dead. I find that your actions do not meet the requirements of my God. Go back to what you heard and believed at first. Hold to it firmly. Repent and turn to, me to, and turn to me again. If you don't wake up, I will come to you suddenly as unexpected as a thief. Yet, there are some in the church in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes with evil. They will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. All who are victorious will be clothed in white. I will never erase their names from the book of life, but I will announce before my Father and His angels that they are mine. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what He is saying to the churches. One of the most popular uh, series on television over the last 12 years or or so was a show called The Walking Dead. It's a television show, if you're not familiar, about a zombie apocalypse and how the survivors of that apocalypse have to figure out how to continue to survive. And you find out through the show that oftentimes the real monsters aren't the zombies, but the human beings. And if you're familiar with zombies in any fashion, zombies are essentially corpses that are brought back to life in some fashion. It's not true life. They don't really have much more than sort of a hunger and they kind of shamble around for the most part. Zombies have what we might call the appearance of life, but there's nothing really that makes them truly alive. There's no breath. There's no heartbeat. There's no soul. There's nothing that truly allows them to thrive. There's no real life in a zombie. And that's the kind of church that we're looking at this morning. Sardis is very much like a zombie. There's a little bit there Just enough to give the reputation or the appearance of life. 
but underneath, there's just death. There's nothing that, that we would recognize that uh, within that church that would demonstrate any kind of true life or true flourishing and thriving as a church. Essentially, Sardis is a zombie church. And unfortunately, I think that there are many Christians and many churches that are similar to zombies. We might have the appearance of life. It might look like we're thriving or flourishing, whether we're individuals or whether we're churches, but the truth is there's really not much there beyond the corpse. Which can be challenging for us. It can be hard for us to hear that. But in, uh, particularly in this time as we've uh, come through and are continuing to have to deal with all the repercussions of, of COVID and as most churches seem to be struggling to get back to where they were before COVID. I've recently read that if a church is back to 50% of what it was before COVID, then they're actually doing pretty well, which is not a particularly good state for us as the church here in the United States. There are many churches that aren't just struggling, but they're dying, they're closing. And in 2014, there's a gentleman by the name of Thomas, Thomas Rayner who put out a book called Autopsy of a Deceased Church. And in his book, he went and looked at a variety of different churches that had to close their doors, that essentially were dead churches. And he looked at all of the common characteristics for these churches and why they ended up closing down. And he put it in a book called Autopsy of a Deceased Church. Seth, if you could put the slide up. I'm going to go through some of those things that he discussed in his book. The very first thing that he noticed in these churches that were dead was those churches treated the past as the hero. They looked back at the past and they longed for it. They wished that things could be like they were. Instead of looking forward to a new thing that God was trying to accomplish or do in that church or in that community, they continued to see the past and wish for it without ever really trying to find or look for a way forward, to look for a new thing that God might be trying to accomplish through them. Everything that they did was to bring back the past instead of trying to find a new future. And the next thing he noticed in these, that was common amongst these churches was that they refused to adapt to the needs of the present community. Many churches were working towards meeting the needs of things that were no longer really problems within their community because communities shift, they change. Problems shift and change. And instead of adapting with those to help folks in their community deal with the difficulties that they were facing, they refused to change and kept trying to meet needs that no longer existed. Again, still sort of dwelling or dealing with the past instead of looking forward to the present and the future. He also discovered that churches that were dying or died focused their budget inward. Meaning they put all their money into programs to staffing, instead of putting money out into the community, out into missions, out into the world, they were putting all their money on simply just surviving. All they did was attempt to survive. Their budget moved from outward to being inward focused. He also noticed that they allowed the Great Commission to become the Great Omission. They forgot what they were called to do as Christians, to go into the world and to make disciples, teaching, teaching folks what Christ had taught them. 
They forgot that their mission, their vision was to go into the world and make disciples. Not make church members, not make people who conform to things that they would have people conform to, to join. Their task, their goal was to go into the world and to make disciples. And churches that have died, who have shut down, forgot their mission to do that. Next slide, please, Seth. The next thing that he noticed was that these churches were becoming preference-driven out of selfishness and personal agendas. Meaning that people were often bickering over things like styles of music and carpet color and whether or not we could afford to, to replace the carpet or whether we should install this or that. The church life became about people fighting over their preferences instead of, again, being focused on the Great Commission, being focused on the vision and mission that they had been given to go out and to make disciples. A dying church or a dead church is one that dies fighting over preferences. Dying churches would see the tenure of their pastors decreasing. Now this is certainly different in each denomination because denominations do the whole pastor thing a little bit differently. But what he was able to to determine was that dying churches would go through pastors every couple of years, sometimes every year. There was no consistency, no continuity. There was no time for a pastor to be able to establish or figure out where God was calling that church to be. There was no way that that a pastor could stay long enough in these dying churches to really discern where God would have them to go. And when you begin to see that sort of transition of pastor after pastor every couple of years, it's a pretty good indicator that things aren't healthy, that things aren't going the way that they are supposed to. Most studies tell us that it takes three to five years for a pastor to settle into a congregation and learn the community and learn to know the people well. But if you're only sticking around for a year or two, it's it's nearly impossible to be able to get to know the church and the community in the way that you need to to be able to minister effectively. So churches that are dying often have a tremendous turnover of pastors. This is a tough one, this next one. Churches that were dying or dead failed to meet regularly for corporate prayer. They failed to get together and pray frequently. This is a hard one, I think, for a lot of churches. Because we are so often, people in churches are so busy, we're going all these different directions, we have so much going on in our schedules that we have forgotten that we are called to be a people who pray. To pray for one another, a people who who lift one another up in prayer. Part of helping one another through each other's burdens is by spending time praying together and for one another. Dying churches see prayer take a back seat. Dying churches neglect to gather together with regularity and pray. If we value prayer as a church, then we're going to be intentional about finding those places where we gather together and pray. And certainly we do that on Sunday mornings. I do my best to make sure that each Sunday morning we incorporate a whole bunch of different kinds of prayer from calls to worship to doing the Lord's Prayer to congregational prayer. I even sneak in having you guys pray when we do the congregational prayer. So when we do the hearing the praises and prayers of our people, guess what? That's you guys getting to pray. I know that might seem slightly sneaky of me, but if we're going to be a people who are thriving as individual Christians and a people who are thriving as the church, there has to be a component where we are gathering together 
and we are praying with regularity, that it becomes a priority. Churches don't survive when they don't pray together. It's just a fact. It's a reality of their existence. I guarantee you that Sardis was a church that did not gather together and pray. They didn't prioritize. Prayer is a part of their community life together. Churches who died or are dying had no sense or clear sense of purpose and vision. They were just sort of floating along, again, sort of relying on their past to keep them afloat. They had no clear sense of vision or mission for their future. And again, that comes back to the Great Commission. It starts with understanding that each one of us has an important role in kingdom building. Each one of us has an important role in building disciples. We all have different gifts and resources and talents to contribute to that picture, but each one of us has a responsibility in that realm to be people who make disciples. And we need to have that at the heart, at the center of our mission and vision as a church body and as individual Christians. We need to have that be a part. Churches that die lose their sense of purpose. We oftentimes see this when folks, older folks, when they pass away, especially if they've lost someone that they loved or spent a significant amount of their life with. Oftentimes you'll see that when one folk or one person in that, that relationship passes away, the other will pass away shortly after because there's, they've lost something so significant that they just don't really have the capacity or will to continue on. They lost some of their sense of purpose. If we want to thrive and grow as Christians and as the church, we need to make sure that we have a very clear sense of vision and purpose. And lastly, Thomas Rayner says that dying or dead churches obsessed over their facilities. Their facility, their, their church building, became the thing that they were most proud of and invested the most time and energy in. Instead of investing in the people, instead of investing in their community, instead of investing in, in, in ministry, they invested in the building. And they did so at their detriment. Now, I say that with the understanding that having a gathering place is important and making sure that we have a gathering place that's nice and, and that's inviting and hospitable and welcoming is, is important. But if that becomes the sole reason we exist to make sure that we have a nice building and we have a, a place where people can gather, then we've significantly missed the boat. We have missed what God has called us to. We don't get together every Sunday morning just so that we can have a nice place. We get together every Sunday morning so that we can worship the Lord and so that we can be equipped to go out into the world again to make disciples. To, we get together to celebrate all the wonderful things that God has done for us. We get together so that we can encourage one another. We get together every Sunday so that we, the people that make up the church, can invest in one another's lives so that we can admonish when necessary, but also encourage and love and bear burdens. And also going back to that whole prayer thing, we can pray for one another. If the building becomes the sole focus for us, if we care about a ding here or a ding there, if we care about things like that above and beyond the people that we can serve, then we have missed something. And those are the kinds of churches that die. Now, I know that some of this isn't always easy for us to hear. It's challenging stuff. But I think it's important to hear, one, as individuals. Again, coming back to this notion that we are individual Christians called to follow Jesus. And we have to make sure that we are doing what Jesus has called us to do and we are being as Jesus called us to be. There's a very real individual component. We each have choices 
that are before us to make. Choices before us that will determine whether or not we will walk in faithfulness or whether or not we will thrive and flourish in the faith or whether or not we will eventually succumb to a worldly way of thinking. And this is important to us, not just as individual Christians, but communally as the body of Christ. If if these things, if any of these things are true of us, then we have to really do a whole lot of thinking and praying about what our future as the church is to be. I don't know about you, but I do not want to end up where Sardis was. I do not want to end up on somebody's list of autopsy churches. I do not want to end up in a place where we find ourselves focusing on any of the junk that keeps us distracted from doing and being what Christ has called us to do and be. Is at the end of the day, we can go through this list of things. At the end of the day, there is one thing that brings life, that brings thriving, that brings wholeness to us. John chapter 6, verse 63, and Romans 8, verse 10 tells us, it is the Spirit that gives life. The Holy Spirit is what brings life to us as believers and what gives life and thriving and wholeness to us as a community of believers. Going back again to that zombie imagery, there is no real life in a zombie. There just, there just isn't. It's the appearance of life, but not true life as life is defined. If we as Christians want true life as it's defined by God, it comes to us through the Holy Spirit. There just isn't any other way. If we want thriving and flourishing, if we want true life, it comes to us through the Spirit. So when we're thinking about all of these things, when when these hard things are before us, what are some things that we can do to pursue life in the Spirit versus the appearance of life as a zombie? Well, A.W. Tozer is a pastor and author. In his book, The Pursuit of Holiness, he says this, the man who would truly know God must give time to Him. Church, that's where we start. If we want to thrive, if we want to have life, it starts with us spending time with God in His presence. Gathering together on Sunday mornings is a wonderful start, but an hour, an hour and a half on a Sunday morning compared to all the rest of the time that we have is just not going to be enough for us to thrive and to grow in the faith. We have to find times and places each day where we are in God's presence. Times and places each day where we just spend time with Him. Whether it's through prayer, whether it's through Bible study, whether it's through uh, singing worship music, whatever that looks like, we have to spend time with Him if we have any expectation towards life and growth in the faith. We need to be alert to our need. In our passage this morning, Jesus says, wake up. We need to wake up to our need, to to wake up to the reality of our individual and communal situation. To be aware of where we are really at. To be honest with ourselves to see the truth of where our heart's at, where our mind's at, where we're really at in our relationship to God. Do we really have life in the Spirit, or are we just appearing to have life? 
like a zombie. We need to be alert to our needs. And we need to make sure that we strengthen what remains to do the work to make us stronger. Listen, there's, it's not a secret. It's perfectly evident that through COVID, we've had some losses in terms of, of people who have left and not come back, people who are engaging online, and things have shifted tremendously for us. It's not a secret. And part of the work that is before us is to strengthen what is here, to build a foundation so that we can then follow through on the mission. And that means each of us has to work to make the choice to strengthen our faith, to make the choice again to be in God's presence. We need to do the work to make what is here stronger to build a foundation so we can build back better. We need to remember what we have received and heard. Remember the gospel message. Remember who we were before Jesus. Remember who we are now that Jesus has come into our lives. And if He's not come into your life and turn your life upside down, today would be a great day to make that choice, to make that decision to follow after Him. We need to remember that we are sinners who are saved by grace. To remember that the Holy Spirit brings life and sanctifies us and is at work to make us more like Him. We need to remember that we are challenged to go out into the world and share that story of transformation with others. That we are called to follow Jesus wherever He goes. It's not an easy life. In fact, He tells us to count the cost of discipleship before we make that decision. We need to remember the Gospel. Remember what we have been taught. Remember what we have heard. Remember what has been instilled in each of us over the years as we have engaged in following after Him. But it's not enough to simply remember. We got to live it. We got to live as we are people who are forgiven. To live as people who are transformed by the gospel. To live as people who are truly called, who are truly on a mission of service, who are truly on a mission to build the kingdom of God in partnership with Him. And in those areas that we fall short, those places where we continue to struggle and sin, those, those places where we know that we have been called to do things that we don't do, and those times where we have left things undone, we need to walk in repentance. To come to God with those areas where we have fallen short and decide to live, act, think differently. To be a people who repent who change their minds, change their lives so that we might move from dead to living. Which brings me to our main point this morning. Our main point is this. A living, thriving church is given life through the Holy Spirit. We can say that that's true for us as individuals as well. A living, thriving Christian is given life through the Holy Spirit. And our life change. We need to commit to building a life in a church that is alive and thriving. And thriving that is the very opposite of the church in Sardis. A church that isn't shambling around like a zombie, but a church that is full of the Spirit, that is full of life in the Spirit. And here's a question of reflection for us as we think about this in this coming week. What am I doing to pursue life in the Spirit 
to avoid being a spiritual zombie. One more time. What am I doing to pursue life in the Spirit to avoid being a spiritual zombie? If we take Tozer seriously, again, that foundational part is spending time with God. And again, we each have a choice to make as individuals, and we as a church have a choice to make. Do we choose death like Sardis? Or are we going to choose life? Life in the Spirit. Again, admittedly, this isn't the easy stuff to grapple with. There are no easy answers in some of this. But it begins with us choosing life over death. With that in mind, would you pray with me? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you today recognizing just how hard it can be sometimes to live a life of faithfulness. So Lord, we pray today that you would empower us with your Holy Spirit to live the life that you have called us to live. We pray that you would equip us to go into the world and to make disciples. We pray, Lord, that we would be individuals and a church that thrives, that is alive in the Spirit. A church that follows you wherever you lead. A church who invests not just in its own survival, but invests in one another and in the community in such a way that the gospel is heard, that the gospel is preached, and that lives are transformed. Lord, bring life where there is death. We pray this in and through the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.